Um, we're really pleased to have as our first presenter in this series, Jeff Garrett, who's the Operational Support Program Manager for the State of Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. Formerly managed the Capital Improvement and Regional Regranting Mini Grant Program at Makaka and uh, previously served as the Director of the Art School at the Flint Institute of Arts in Flint, Michigan. And he studied at Mott College and the University of Michigan Flint, where he received a BS in art education. And he earned a Master of Fine Arts uh, degree in ceramics with distinction from Indian and uh, Indiana State University. So please join me in welcoming Jeff Garrett presenting um, our granting program. Hey, good afternoon, all. All righty, so I am, uh, First thing to note is that I'm working from home, but I'm also working at home with two boys, a spouse and a dog. And so just that that could happen at any moment, just putting that out there. Also, uh, the big takeaway from today is I'm gonna go through a lot of information. And so the big thing is to know uh, that you can always contact us uh, and get information from us because our job is to help you guys navigate through the system and to help you guys uh, submit a grant application to our programs. And so uh, you can reach out to any one of us and then uh, we'll get you to where you need to be and, and help you through the process. But uh, now I'm just gonna go right to uh, a, a PowerPoint. And it's gonna be, let me open it up here. There we go. So can you guys see the, just the PowerPoint now? Everyone's good with that? Okay, great, all righty. I see some familiar faces too, this is great. <laughs> Okay, so I'm a little bit casual, a little bit relaxed. Uh, so feel free to uh, ask questions and, um, and I'll go through the slides. We have a couple hundred to go through today, but I speak really fast. Wait a minute, 34 slides to go through today and then uh, you can always get back to me. Okay, so I am a, a program manager, a program officer with the State of Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. So we are your state arts agency. And so we are charged with the task of utilizing 0.003 of a percent of the state's budget uh, to promote arts and culture throughout the state. And <clears throat> on average, we usually uh, directly, we do about 600 grants uh, per year. In other programs, we usually average around 1,100 grants per year that we send out. We hit almost all of the counties in the state of Michigan. Last year, we were 75 of 83, pretty good, but we're in all the House and Senate districts, so we have represented well statewide. And uh, we always follow, our grant period follows the state of Michigan's fiscal year. So we're talking about projects or, uh, or events that you would want to apply for funding for that begin on October 1st and end on September 30th. So in, uh, we knew this when, we, when I said I was gonna do this in June that our deadline for the direct grants for fiscal year 2021 has already passed, but there's still a couple grant programs that are still available uh, with grant deadlines of August 3rd and also January 15th. So who we are is uh, we're the State Arts Agency for the state of Michigan. And so we were uh, created in the 60s when the National Endowment for the Arts came on and then uh, charged each state with uh, creating a council as well. And so we've, we've been around for many years. We've had uh, our budget has gone up and down and we'd like to consider ourselves uh, on the rebound since the 2008, uh, 2010, we went down to a million dollars and now we're back up to right around 10 million. I would like to add that today we were a we received word from the National Endowment for the Arts that the state of Michigan was uh, granted $840,000 for fiscal year 21, which is great. So that'll, uh, we just, uh, what that means is they're gonna give us the, the funding and then the state of Michigan will match that. So that's a good start to our budget uh, for fiscal year 2021. Other than that, I don't have any information with uh, regard to the future. We're all, we're all waiting to see what happens in July and August and throughout the fall. Okay, so uh, just a little bit about our team. So Allison Watson is our director and uh, the two folks on the right, Ashley and Adam are uh, compliance and financial people. We call them the A-team, Adam and Ashley, and uh, they're great to work with. We're also down two persons on our staff right now and probably will be for a while because of hiring freezes. Uh, and then our program managers are gonna be Chad Badgero, Jackie Lillis Warwick, and then myself. And so how it works is, you will uh, get the guidelines off of the MCACA website. The URL is 90 some characters long. The best way to try to find us is just to Google MCACA and we'll pop up in the first two or three there and you can find us that way. We're, we're within the MEDC's website. So we're housed within the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, but we're slightly separate or outside of them. They're just, they're kind of like our fiduciary. 
Uh, you get the guidelines, you create an account in Smart Simple, and then from there you go through the process of entering information about the organization, you create an account, and then you uh, submit the application. And then from there, uh, your application is mixed in with all the other applications and it's reviewed in the summertime. So our, the deadline was June 1 for the five main MCACA direct grants. Uh, and then so they'll begin reviewing those at the end of June here, the June 24th, I think is the first day of panels. So they'll review applications throughout the summer. Uh, as an applicant, you're invited to uh, attend the, the review of your, of your application. Of course, this year, not in person, so you'd be invited to Zoom in or Skype in and watch. You can call in and listen. And then even afterwards, after the panel review is done and we do the awards announcement in September, you can also contact us and ask for the panel comments that were written about your application. Because ideally, the goal is with our grant programs is to get you to write a great grant and to continue to write great grants throughout the organization's uh, history. In September, usually around the second week of September, we do the awards announcement. Uh, and then come October 1, the fiscal year begins, and then we start working on contract language and getting out uh, all the information to uh, get, your, get your funds in place so you can do your project. Excuse me, my allergies are crushing me the last couple of days. Uh, and then so after that, after you, if you're awarded funding, you, you receive the funding in several installments, sometimes as many as uh, three or four, but usually one or two, depending on how, loud, how large the amount is. Uh, then you submit your final report, and then, then you go ahead and apply again for the next year. So before we get too far into the programs, just this is a quick uh, applicant and eligibility chart that we have. And so this is, uh, you can kind of catch yourself in one of these nonprofits. So all of our grant programs are only available to nonprofit organizations uh, in the state of Michigan, with the exception of the professional development mini grant, which an individual person can apply for that. But all the other ones are for nonprofits. And so we basically have two big categories of nonprofits. We have nonprofit arts and culture organizations, and then we just have everyone else, all the other nonprofits. So the nonprofit arts and culture organization is pretty, pretty broad in the sense of what we consider arts and culture. And you can determine your, your, your tax ID, your EIN code, or your tax status uh, by checking uh, your paperwork. But usually it starts with the letter A and then a number after that. And so just a couple examples of some nonprofit arts and culture organizations would be, of course, museums and galleries, uh, theaters, uh, historical centers, historical societies, uh, and all those in between. So there's, there's quite a bit that can fall into there. And if not, then, then the organization would apply for uh, a project support instead of operations. But the two main programs, if you can see my cursor running around, the two main programs for MCAC is gonna be operational support and project support. So if you can't apply in uh, operations and you apply in project, and the dollar amounts are pretty similar except unless you get into the higher tiers operations. If you're operating at 14 million and above, then you can apply for a little bit more money. But the majority of applicants are usually 25 to 30,000 requests in operations and uh, the maximum request for a project is 30,000. So this, this chart here, um, Brian has a copy of this. Also, it's also attached to a document that has a quick three sentence uh, overview of each grant program. So at the end there, he can share this the information with you guys as well. And you can also share the, the PowerPoint as well, that's fine encouraged. Okay, so the first program is operational support. So this is the program that I oversee. And it's, it's the, it's the uh, council's largest program. Uh, usually about 300 applications come in per year. And so it is dependent upon the organization's uh, unrestricted revenue less in kind for three years in a row. So if you fall into this category between 10,000 and 250,000, then you can apply for 25,000. And it just kind of goes on up from there. So again, it's, it's all eligibility. So you're a nonprofit arts and culture, you're a 501c3, you're in the state of Michigan. Uh, you have what's uh, called a Dunn's number, which is the Dunn and Bradstreet number. It's a quick one, one day email to Dunn and Bradstreet and they come back with you with a number that assigns to your organization. These are all, it's all in the guidelines. <clears throat> uh, and with operational support, you have to be in operation for at least uh, three years consecutive. And as well as you have to have at least uh, 10,000 and unrestricted uh, revenue less in kind. And so the, one of the benefits of, uh, of operational support is the fact that you're not applying for a specific project. You're not applying for your summer car fest project. You're not applying for uh, a, a week long festival of events. You're just applying for operations. So the majority of organizations tend to use operational support for usually staff, usually to pay the director and the assistant director. Although sometimes they spread it out amongst other things, but you can, anything it takes to keep the doors open on your organization, that's operational support. And uh, 
I was trying to think of a couple examples of some good uh, organizations that may fit into your guys' category. Ari Olds Museum is a continued uh, applicant uh, for funding from MCACA. Uh, there's a, a museum up in Nobbin Way on the Upper Peninsula called the Top of the Lake Somerville Museum. They're a great applicant. They apply for funding every year because they're a museum and they support uh, Somerville culture. And if you haven't been there, you should go through it <laughs> when you're on two next time in the UP. Uh, with operations, you, you apply and then if you score a 95 or above, you don't have to go through the whole process for the next uh, two years after that. Uh, so that's another bonus there. Uh, but again, the deadline for that one is uh, June 1. So if you can't apply an operational support, then your next guess is going to be uh, project support and that would be Chad's program. Project support is uh, just funding for a specific, I'm trying to move the bar, okay, sorry. I had part of everyone's heads was covering up part of my language here. Okay, so uh, project support is for a specific project and you can be, you can use that term loosely with regard to an umbrella as far as you can fund a week long festival or you can just do a one day event or a, a series or something along those lines. And so this is for uh, organizations that are not arts and cultural. So now we're talking about colleges and universities. We're talking about non arts related uh, nonprofit organizations and also municipalities because sometimes Cities, townships, and villages sometimes have a project or an event, and so they'll apply for project support to, to put that event on or to maintain it. And, it. and again, it's the same requirements as far as you're located in the state of Michigan, you're open accessible to the public, and you're a 501c3. So it's a minimum request of 5,000 for project support with a maximum of 30,000. And then uh, all of our grant programs are on a, on a cash match basis, so one-to-one. -one. So if you ask for 5,000, that means you have 5,000 that you're gonna uh, match it with as well. And with all the larger MCACA direct grants, there's no in-kind does not count towards your match, but in the mini grant programs, you can use uh, in-kind as part of your match. And again, the application deadline for this program was June 1, but so now you wanna be thinking about applying for next year. So the our programs are gonna open up uh, in, in March, and then you'll have about three months to uh, work with us, contact us, ask us lots of questions, send us many emails, and get your application in and apply before that June 1 deadline. Another program that is uh, unique to the state of Michigan and also with state arts agencies is capital improvement. And so with capital improvement, it's a program where you can request funding to either do a facility enhancement or to purchase equipment. And so, this program is limited to only those who can apply in operational support and also municipalities. So this is a good time to, to quickly jump in and chat briefly about partnerships. A lot of organizations sometimes will partner with municipalities or partner with other nonprofits to apply on their behalf and then hire them to do projects. That's totally, uh, that's how a lot of artists and arts organizations find work here in the state. For example, if you have uh, a city that you work within, you have a festival or event there or some uh, project you do every year in the city, you know, you might want to encourage the city to apply for, for equipment that may help out your, your event as well as others at Bethesda throughout the year. We usually see a lot of municipal uh, applicants for equipment simply because um, the equipment grants are super uh, efficient. It's, it's, it's what you want, it's how you're going to get it, what you're going to do when you get it, and that's it. So it's a pretty direct request. And a lot, of, a lot of municipalities tend to purchase equipment like portable sound equipment, portable light equipment. Uh, some, some have purchased uh, tents to have events inside of. Some have, uh, have purchased benches or portable stages. These are all things that uh, municipalities will apply for to help their uh, programs become uh, better. And then again, that one again is the, one of the big ones that's due on June 1st. And then there's two categories, facility and equipment. So, a lot of folks tend to apply for facility improvements if they have, if they own the building or they have a long-term lease. And so this program actually requires a long-term. 10 years is okay, 20 is great, 20 and above is fantastic. Uh, it's just to prevent organizations from applying to put an elevator in their building that they rent. And then next year the landlord comes in and says, this is a really great elevator, get out. <laughs> or uh, you know, we're gonna raise your rent. So. Uh, if you don't have a long-term lease or you don't have a permanent home, then the equipment grants are going to be the one for you to apply for. And again, in the, and it's pretty broad as far as what you can apply for with equipment. Basically, if you can take it with you, then it's equipment. And if it has, if it's, if it's part of the facility, like a roof or a floor or windows or HVAC or electric, then those are types of things that you're going to uh, use for a facility improvement. 
And so the basic on this one is it's a minimum of $5,000 requests with a maximum of 100,000. I will say that this is our most competitive program, usually has around 2.4 to 2.6 million to grant out and receives about six to $7 million in requests. But this is the one that the governor appointed council members struggle with the most with regard to trying to figure out what funding plan to go with. I think if you look at our numbers throughout the past uh, five, six years, the council pretty much is under the, the, the strong belief that something is better than nothing. And so even though organizations will apply for the maximum funding, they don't receive it, they usually never turn it down. They still take what they can get. And then so you have options to deal with that. If you apply for 100,000, you only get 50,000, then you can restructure your grant request to only do half the project. Then you can come back and apply for the second half uh, later on. This is one exception with the capital improvement is that you can use in kind, but not in the form of labor. You can use it in the form of materials. So let's say if you were doing your roof and Kelly's roofing company was going to donate some squares of shingles to your organization, then you could use that as part of your match to make that cash match. Okay, the next two programs may not be so applicable to you guys, but just so you know, and just so it's out there, arts and education uh, is where schools can apply. Uh, to have an artist come in and work with uh, the organization, but also you can have schools come to your organization and do work there. So that's something to consider as well. This is one of uh, Chad's programs that he oversees. And this is uh, four K through 12 uh, for groups. And so with this one, it's a 5,000 minimum, 20,000 maximum requests. Again, it's a one-to-one -one cash match, but you can also use teacher administrative time towards the match. So I don't know how much teachers make. I'm pretty sure they make thousands of dollars an hour. So you can make up that match pretty quick. Just kidding. But it helps out with making that match. And again, the deadline for that was June 1. And the last MCACA direct program that was June 1 is the new leaders. And so this is a program that has uh, gone through some changes for the past few years that we, we just opened it up to full year funding last year. Uh, we think it went pretty well and now we're uh, messing around a little bit with the with the eligibility with regard to who can apply and so it used to be with just uh you would have a program for a young person to take charge of but now it's opened up to the idea of a youth or a teen council or a young professionals group within your organization and so we uh, define young as 14 to 30 so that's a pretty good range um, to work with but this is again something to consider for next year it's a it's a small almost like a mini grant but the idea is to give young people a, a little bit of uh, experience or mentorship with regard to leadership in the field and again so the deadline for that was june 1 and so that wraps up uh, all of the the five main grant programs that we offer the uh, with a june 1 deadline operational support project support capital improvement, arts and education, and uh, new leaders. So right now, I guess you can kind of put those on the back burner. You can kind of wait off on those, uh, take a look at the information. The big thing right now is to find out what you're eligible to apply for, and then you can focus in on, on grant programs there later on. And then contact us next uh, winter or somewhere later on. Oops, sorry. And then we can start talking about how to get your stuff together to apply by that June 1 deadline. But upcoming right now in the summer, we have two grant programs that are mini grant programs. And so the mini grant program is uh, basically our decentralized funding program. So we uh, have 15 regional granting agencies throughout the state of Michigan. Uh, they're divided up by county. And so, for example, there are three in the Upper Peninsula and then the other 12 are downstate and in particular in Southeast Michigan. Uh, Detroit area has two regions, just uh, Wayne County itself is one region, 10B, and then Oakland and Macomb is 10A. But each one of those organizations, each one of those regions has a, a regranter that uh, oversees the program on our behalf. And so if you're in Oakland or Wayne County or Oakland or Macomb County, it's the Anton Art Center. And if you're in uh, Wayne County, it's going to be Culture Source. And the list for these uh, contact information for these is on our website as well. But when you apply for a mini grant, the mini grant Excuse me for a moment. Okay, sorry. So when you apply for the MCACA direct grants, those first five I talked about, you compete with all the operational support applications throughout the state of Michigan. And the same thing with all the other programs, you compete statewide. 
if you apply for a mini grant, you're only competing with applications from that region. So if you apply in Region 10B or Wayne County, you're only you're only competing with applications from Wayne County and the other, you know, if you apply in 10A or then you compete with those ones. So you're not, the applicant pool is not as great and it's not as uh, competitive number wise with the number of applications you compete with. And the, the deadlines to, to note for these two are going to be uh, August 3rd and also January 15th. So we have two programs and mini grants. These are the regions that used to be broken up uh, under former administration into 10 regions. Of course, we have it into five. I mean, we have it into 15 because we felt that uh, in particular the Upper Peninsula is more than just one region. So we have uh, central and then east and west uh, regions to work with. Our first mini grant program is the mini grant arts projects and the second one is professional development. So arts projects is just like the larger project support. It's just a smaller amount of money and you can use in kind and uh, professional organizational development is uh, just what it says. You can use these funds to either attend a workshop or a conference or you can bring a uh, consultant or someone to come in and work with your organization to help do what it does better. So again, the, the deadline is August 3rd, so you still have uh, a little less than two months to get that in. You could, you could totally get one in uh, for this year for beginning of October 1. And then uh, we have a second round. So some regions do not have second round funding. Some of them just give out all their funding in the first round. But I do know that 10A and 10B, those three counties I talked about, they usually have a second round. So if you don't get it in by August 3rd, you can definitely check into trying to get it in by January 15th. The only catch is when you apply for August 3rd, you're applying for the whole fiscal year, October 1 through September 30th. But if you're applying for round two, uh, it's for the second half of the year. So it's March 1st uh, through September 30th, just to finish that out. Hey Jeff, do you mind if I make a comment real quick? Sure. So um, something, a question about professional development was just that, um, or a comment to me, like our organization received a professional development grant for um, sending me to a grant writers conference. Correct. So that was awesome. Um, I did that probably six or seven years ago. So we applied for that mini grant. So yeah. when we do these meetings, I always acknowledge that, that that was really important and that helped I, because I did not have grant writing experience before doing that. So that it was a terrific grant and the match was only like 20% or something like that. So um, it was yeah, a really great yeah, so it was yeah. a really great opportunity. And I went out of state to Chicago for four days for this conference to do this. Yep, yeah, yep. I'll get to that. Yeah, that's great stuff. And because we used to talk about the uh, Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana used to have one too. And we would all, we had a, quite a few applicants in the past who would apply for funding to go to their, uh, like a weekend grant writing workshop that they would hold or a certificate program they had. Yep. You just can't use POD to uh, obtain college credit. So sorry, grad students. <laughs> All right, so a little more focus on uh, arts projects. So again, it's, it's a mini grant. So it's $4,000 with a one-to-one -one match. But it's uh, the, the big difference between this and project support is other than the, the request amount maximum is the fact that you can use in-kind to make part of your match. So if you, let's say you're an all-volunteer organization and you're applying for mini grant arts projects, well, then you can use your volunteers' time as part of your match. I mean, most volunteers are usually... I can be last time I checked with the feds, but it's like 22 to $25 an hour is what a volunteer is worth to your organization. And so you can use that to make, to make your match. And in some cases it adds up pretty, pretty fast, depending on how much you have. This is also open to uh, everybody. So arts and cultural nonprofits, nonprofits, and also uh, K through 12 schools and municipalities. They can all apply uh, for mini grant arts projects. The only ones that can't are colleges and universities. Again, this one's also located in the state of Michigan, but you do not have to be a 501c3. You just have to be registered as a nonprofit in the state of Michigan. So a lot of organizations, smaller ones and beginning ones, use mini grant arts projects to build up uh, to the point where they can either apply for project support or they can apply for operational support. So it's a, it's a step up program for some, but also uh, a lot of people utilize this program. It, it gets us into a lot of the small counties, small organizations that the big grants can't. So it, it's really great for the state of Michigan and for everyone uh, that can attend and be part of these events. <clears throat> and so again, this is, you know, two rounds, you have round one and round two. So if you're applying for round one, you're applying for the whole year. If you're applying for round two, it's just the second half. So if you apply for round one and don't get funding, 
you should contact the regrantor and find out what I need to, where you can make things better and uh, improve on your application and apply again for the second round. And the second one is the mini grant professional development. And so we just call it POD, but so you can, uh, organizations can apply, only, non, only arts and cultural organizations can apply for POD, but also individuals can. So if you're an individual in a, in a non, in a, this is so confusing my language. If you're an individual in a non arts and cultural nonprofit, you can apply as an individual for POD. And uh, Jill is right. You can, this is the only grant that you can use uh, state funds to leave the state of Michigan to attend a workshop or a conference of some sort. And it's, it's to do just that, it's to help, it does two things. One, it sends Michigan arts and organizations and arts and cultural personnel out into the field to see what other people are doing in other parts of the country and bring it back to Michigan. But it also takes what we're doing in Michigan and takes to the conference and spreads to other people what we're doing in Michigan. So it, it's a, it's a two-way avenue and it's beneficial for everybody. And again, it's, it's the only one that individuals can apply for and the only one you can use funds to go out of state. And then if you, when you look at the guidelines for POD, uh, there's a whole page, just a sample, but just a page of, of potential workshops or organizations that, uh, that we have a lot of people apply to. There's a lot of organizations that are out there. All right. And so yeah, so conferences, education and training, but also if you're, a non, if you're an arts and culture nonprofit, you can apply for uh, someone to come in and work with your organization. Let's say you want to work on a five or a 10 year strategic plan, or you want to work on uh, board engagement or governance, you can uh, hire a consultant to come in and work with those. This program is uh, a $1,500 maximum request with a 25% match. So you're looking at $1,875, uh, 375 from the, from the awardee and 1,500 from the state. And so one question that comes up with this program in particular is, uh, I want to apply for the annual uh, anti-water coloring conference that happens in Tennessee every year, but they don't have their information out until after the deadline to apply. So what do I do? So we always advise people to just be frank in your narrative and say, hey, I'm applying to go to the 2022 conference, but the information's not out yet. So I've attached information from the 2021 conference so you can get an idea of what, what to expect and what the organization is about and what the conference usually covers. That's helpful. Okay, any questions about our grant programs? Not yet. They'll come to you after we later on today. Be like, oh, I should have asked them that. But then just send us an email or give me a call. Okay, so the last two or three slides are really just a little bit about uh, the MCACA application and review process, and then a little bit about uh, things to consider when writing your grant. This applicable is just really across the field uh, to more than just uh, more than just MCAC grants, but. So first, the process is you, you uh, create an account in Smart Simple. You enter in all your information in the organizational profile. So you're going to enter information about the, the board and the history of the organization and a couple of the documents and demographics and things you can attach in there. And then, then you can apply. So you apply for a grant. And all the, all the grants go into uh, this hopper. And then uh, they go down into groups of usually 15 to 20 applications. So we will create panels to review your, your application. And the panelists are people just uh, such as yourself. So usually people that are in development or people that are uh, just uh, involved the administrative level of organizations and nonprofits that, that volunteer their time to read and score these applications, as well as maybe learn a little bit about applications so they can use the information for their own. So it's, it's also a little bit of education involved and there's some accidental learning occurs. But the applications all go into groups, into a big group. So we take all the operational support applications and put them into the hopper and we break them down into groups of usually 15 to 20. And then, then we'll assign five people to read those applications. So we have 20 applications that are read and scored by five people. So those five people read the same applications, they all score them. And then uh, they make their comments in Smart Simple and they submit their scores. And then uh, they, they're looking for how well the applicant has adhered to the guidelines. So in each program has a page called review criteria, and that's usually what you use to draft your narrative. That's gonna be your outline for the narrative. And the guidelines state that as well. Our guidelines are pretty thorough with regard to what to walk through on how to apply for uh, an MCACA grant. So they're scoring your application based on how well you adhere to the guidelines. Did you supply what was asked for? Did you fill in the information that was requested? Did you submit a four page narrative? And then uh, go on from there. And then 
they get usually about 30 days to read and score the applications and then they meet in person. This year, of course, it's gonna be virtual. So this year we're gonna do all of our uh, panel reviews on Skype business. So you'll be able to log in and watch your, your application be reviewed by the five panelists. And then uh, they'll, they'll finalize their score. And then at the end of the day, those applications go back into the giant pool of other operational support program panels. And then uh, they'll be arranged from a, from a series of 100 down to a zero. So your, your application is going to get scored from a zero to 100. So all the scored ones go back in there. They arrange them from 100 down to zero. And then uh, anything with a score of 79 or below was cut off and pushed to the side because those are uh, what we consider to be not, not fundable. They're not in the funding range. And then the scores of 80 and above go to uh, the governor appointed council members in the form of funding plans, which they will uh, argue and uh, deliberate over for a few days and come up with a solution where they which one they uh, are going to go with, which one they support. And then uh, those are recommended for funding. And then the grant awards happen. Usually it's the second Friday in February, or I mean in September. It just depends on the calendar, but we usually shoot for the second week of, uh, of September to make those awards announcements. Usually do it right in Lansing. Uh, this year, of course, again, it'll be virtual. So we'll just do it online. Everyone can log in and then uh, we'll give out the, uh, who it's going to, the list of the yays and the nays. So when, when writing uh, a grant uh, application for MCACA and really for any, any, any funder, foundation, corporate, whatever, uh, the big thing is, is to read the guidelines first, okay? Maybe read them twice, I don't know, read them four or five, six times. Uh, but in, in our case, MCACA, our, our guidelines are step-by-step, -step. do this, do this, do this, do this supply this, supply this, supply this. Uh, so it's the people that don't do that are the ones that do not score well. And the ones that do do that do score well. It's kind of, it's just like high school. So uh, some advice is of course was uh, don't wait till the last minute because this is when the system becomes overloaded. Uh, I will say from personal experience as of uh, 10 days ago uh, in operational support out of the 302 applications that came in, uh, 147 came in on June 1st. So I would recommend trying to submit it a week or two before. That way, if you think about something and want to go back and change it, you can get with us. We can put it back in draft. You can make the revision and resubmit it before it's locked in for review. So just saying, don't wait, uh, even though I'm great at it. Also, uh, ask, ask a staff for help. Ask us. Our job as program managers is to help you uh, uh, submit a grant application for funding. So uh, we're all available. We're all uh, super friendly, except for Allison. And, uh, and we're all approachable. Just kidding, Allison's great too. When you're uh, looking at the guidelines, the, the main meat and potatoes of any of the grant programs is gonna be the narrative. It's a four page document, it's 12 point font, it's one inch, it's one inch margins all the way around and you'll get scored on that. So if you only submit three pages, a panelist may say, well, why'd they leave the fourth page blank? I mean, they had so much more information they could relay on there, why they leave it blank? Or the exact opposite is if you submit a nine page narrative, a panelist will say, well, the guideline said four pages, so I stopped reading at page four. I didn't score anything on five, six, seven, eight, or nine. So just be aware of that. It's about following the guidelines and submitting what's requested. When, when you draft your narrative, uh, be clear, be concise, be compelling. Use the review criteria as an outline for your narrative. Each, each grant program has a page in there. Use your own page 12 or 14 that has just entitled review criteria. And those review criteria are in bold and they have bullet points underneath it. So when you're drafting your narrative, use that bold as your, put it right on your narrative in bold and underneath it, address the bullet points that you can and then keep going through and then go back and turn it into some sort of a sentence or a story that makes sense. But the idea is that you wanna make it easy for a panelist that when they're scoring your narrative, they're looking at the review criteria and they're looking at your narrative and they can easily cross left and right, back and forth, go, oh, no, there's where we're talking about quality and management. Okay, oh, there's we're talking about this. And so make it easy for them to score you uh, well. Where confusion happens is when, uh, when a narrative is all over the place or redundant or addresses things out of order, and then you make a panel of search for stuff and chances are they're gonna miss it and then you're gonna result in a loss of points. So just make sure you're clear, concise, and compelling. Another thing is it's, it's petty, but uh, check your spelling 
check the grammar. You know, that's, I didn't hear. So just make sure you do that. Make sure it's clear. Follow the follow the format that's required. Page limits, font size, margins. Make sure they're all in PDFs as if required, uh, et cetera. So just make sure you're following those guidelines, those directions. You don't want to give a panelist any reason to mark you to take points away. Uh, also, with regard to your organization's presence, keep keep online up to date. Don't have a calendar on your website from 2014 because it's 2020 now. So make sure the stuff is up to date and uh, at least fairly current because when panelists are reviewing your application, a significant portion of them are going to visit your website. All the operational support applicants or panelists will visit your website, but other programs they'll visit as well. Also make sure that your links for transparency work. That means in your narrative, sometimes people put links in there to uh, their, their web page, their, their website, or they'll put, they'll put a link in there that goes to their uh, web page that has their board members on it or has financial information about the organization for the past couple of years or their GuideStar uh, link that shows just a quick snapshot of nonprofit uh, information about the organization. Make sure all your links work. And also, if you make a claim, be sure that you can back it up. What that means is when you're, when you're drafting your narrative and you're talking about your project and you're talking about the people that involved in your project, stay away from comments that are like, we only use world-class artists for our projects or you know, we only use the best. That's pretty, pretty vague. So uh, panelists respond more to uh, detail. So why are they world-class? Why are they the best? So go ahead and uh, state that you use only the best people, but explain why or how your process is for determining that or uh, just uh, a little more detail, trying to be too vague. But also don't run the risk of just doing that one and a half run on sentence of, of names of name dropping of people that are in the field. Uh, also uh, new to our, to our grant application process this year was a, a section called media library. Uh, in the past, you could just create a PDF document and have a series of links on it that would take you to YouTube to show uh, examples or images or short movies of your organization or its, or its projects. And you can still do that, but also in Smart Simple, you can also use uh, the media library to just go ahead and upload movies or images. The big thing is, is that when you submit media or if you have a link to go to your website or if you have a link that goes to a video of the 2019 Summerfest Extravaganza Spectacular, make sure that it's titled that so that when a panelist clicks on it, they know what they're clicking on. Or if they, if they click on an image and it's just a, a, an image of some kids at a table doing something, that's nice, but we don't know what we're looking at. So make sure you have a, a title on there somehow. Like this, is, this is an image of the, uh, the, of the table or the activities table at the 2018, whatever, whatever. So just make sure that things are, uh, have titles and that are clearly labeled so people know what they're looking at or what they're gonna see. And even though I've gone on and on about the, the narrative, uh, the application is the full application. So that means that make sure the organizational profile is all correct and up to date, make sure you filled in all the information that's requested, and then the narrative. I, you know, the narrative is, is, for most programs, is usually about two thirds or three quarters of uh, the overall points for the, for the application, but don't, don't stray or leave out the other stuff. It's all, it's all part of it, it's all super important. You just wanna be, uh, you just want to make sure you address the address the review criteria. In most cases, it's really just talking about who you are, what you want to do, how you're going to do it, and then uh, go on from there. So just try to be as um, concrete, clear, and specific as possible with regard to your narrative and also the overall application. And then the last thing is really just just uh, <laughs> the slide of a bunch of names and email addresses on there. But again, it's you really can just uh, email us is the key right now because we're all working uh, off site, but, and you can call us and it gets passed through to our cell phones, but uh, email is, is pretty quick. We're all here, we're all available. Uh, we have a little bit of adjusted schedules to work with through the end of July, we're aware of so far, but so uh, some of us aren't available on some days, but the other half is and vice versa. So, but if, if, you, if you send us an email, we're usually back with you that day, uh, if not the next day for sure. Amen. I think that, yeah, that, that's my last slide. So, uh, Brian, let me turn it back. Do I have to turn it back over to you or can you, I can stop share. Okay, great. Was that totally overwhelming? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe what we could do is all thank Jeff virtually. Right. I don't know if anybody else has. <laughs> there you go, what a trooper.
right. yeah, but, and we do have a few questions to throw out yeah, sure. here uh, before we before we kind of wrap it up. Uh, one was the question about the match. Why, yeah. why do some of the uh, MCACA grants allow in-kind and some do not? Uh, it's for, the in-kind is for many grants because it's, it's for smaller organizations that usually have budgets under 10,000 or more in revenue, annual revenue. And so uh, in some cases, it's that, that ability to use in-kind for the match is key for them to make it. And so, so an organization, everyone can apply for Operations, but not everyone, but those who can apply for operations support can also apply for mini-grant arts projects, okay? And those who can apply for project support can also apply for projects, uh, mini-grants arts projects. The catch is if you're awarded both, you have to pick one or the other. And in most cases, the organization will pick the larger dollar amount because, you know, it's more, it's more funds. But in some cases, there are organizations that it'll be like, if it's only a difference of $1,000, they'll take the mini-grant because they can use in-kind as their match instead of having to come up with 5000 or, you know, a couple thousand in cash, so... It's easy. When you're applying for an MCACA grant, remember it's a proposal at that point. So you don't have to have applicant cash in hand when you're applying. You can indicate in your narrative. You can also indicate on your budget uh, that some funds are pending or, um, or confirmed. So because you know, you, your sources of income come from all over the place as a nonprofit. So you have corporate support, you have some foundation support, you have your donor base, and then uh, hopefully you have MCACA. And so these are all parts that help make up uh, for your funding. All the grant programs require a, a project specific budget with the exception of operational support. So operational support applications have to have what's called a funder report. And that's a, that's a, I don't wanna scare anybody away, but it's, it's, a, it's a, Data Arts is a website that uses uh, information from an organization for the past three years to create what's called the funder report. So, if you do operational support for the first time, that means you have to go in and create three years of uh, funder report information. So you have to go back and enter information for 2017, 2018, and 2019. Uh, but once you do it, you just have to maintain it every year. And so what Data Arts is, is it, it uses, it, it, um, it takes data from an organization, financial data, revenue expenses, but it also takes participation summary numbers and all kinds of other uh, numbers and attendance numbers from all your events and it keeps track of it for you. So then you can use that information later to one, you can use it to, uh, to create the funder report to apply for MCACA funding. You can also use that data to create annual reports and a whole handful of other reports that you can use that information for. You can also compare your organization to other organizations of similar size and stature uh, anonymously, but you can also see how other people in your field or your, your realm do uh, as well. And so for most, it's, it's a bit of a hurdle the first time through it, but after they get through it, they, it's, it's fine or they get, they get it. I will say this, SMU Data Arts for 2021, it's gonna come out next in the winter. Uh, so for next year, they used to ask a lot of questions. And then three years ago, they refined it and they only ask a bunch of questions. And then for the upcoming year, they're gonna take another two thirds uh, to a third off of that. So they just keep refining it. I think what happened was is in the beginning, SMU Data Arts was, was developed by uh, colleges and universities as a data format platform to get all this information about arts and culture organizations throughout the country. Uh, and then they realized that, that it was developed by them and not by the field. And so uh, as they've taken into consideration of what, what us, the field really need or can, can supply, they keep refining it. So it's, it'll be a lot better next year than it has been in the past. And they've, they've kind of moved towards the idea of kind of like a TurboTax, just click on stuff and it takes you where you need to go. So it's a little bit more intuitive instead of having to dig through your stuff. But. Sure. Okay. Uh, and another question was uh, about the eligibility of private foundations, you know, versus, um, you know, sort of other, when you say typical 501c3. So is it just as eligible if you are a private foundation that is a 501c3? No, foundations aren't eligible. No. And even in, even in the nonprofit world, there are a few nonprofits that are not eligible, like friends of organizations, like organizations that exist just solely to raise funds for another nonprofit. There's a few of those in the state, but, uh, and then we also have organizations that have the name friends of so-and-so organization, but they're not really a friends of organization. They're, a, they're the organization. They just had, they just picked the wrong name. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Foundations are not eligible, no. Okay. Um, and, and I do want to give the opportunity. I know there are others on the call. And, and earlier in this um, presentation, you kind of made that comment, 
you know, saying that maybe some of this is applicable to us and maybe it's not. And I think one of the values of having this lunch and learn is that we have learned directly over, over the years that there are many, many op, op, uh, opportunities to apply arts and culture, uh, you know, principles to our automotive heritage grants. So it's not the typical just erect your uh, exhibit or, or redo your car or whatever. That there, We've even had Motor City some recent a great success with a project. I know Don Nicholson is on the call. He connected us with a program called STEP, Services to Enhance Potential, in which the project was students creating automotive art as a part of their uh, special needs uh, learning opportunities, and, and it's an award-winning project. So I'm encouraging others who are on the call not to let this opportunity pass by if they've got questions to pose to Jeff. Uh, just kind of unmute yourselves and have at it. The big thing is partnerships. If you're not if you're not directly eligible to apply for an MCACA grant, you know someone who can. So, and that's so that you just partner with them. That's how we we get a lot of organizations, a lot of groups, and a lot of individual artists can find work or, or continue their projects with funding by using uh, a partner to, to apply on their behalf. That's how that's how we get stuff done. Jeff. Yeah. Don Nicholson here. Um, I'm, I was wondering, I'm a for-profit business. We put on automotive events throughout uh, Southeast Michigan. We work with different communities and uh, other nonprofits. Would there be something available to us or would we have to go through one of the nonprofits that we're working with and funnel it through? Right. Uh, yeah. So the only thing that a, a for-profit can apply for, you, Don, could apply as an individual arts and cultural administrator. Let's okay. say you're overseeing the project. So that basically means that you could apply for a professional development grant and that's it, the POD. But you can, but if you, if you have nonprofits and communities that you work within that you do your projects in, or even municipalities themselves, they can apply for funding to do those projects. And then you're just, you're, you're the project director. Okay, so they, thank you. They, they apply, it's all their information. They're the applicant, but they're hiring you to do the project. Yep. Okay. Any other questions as we... Pick, pick Russell right. online with the uh, Fred, Hold on. Highland, Highland Recreation Area. We are a 501c3, and uh, we're supporting the Edsel and Eleanor Ford former Haven Hill estate. Okay. But we are inside the state recreation area, and we don't own the buildings. Okay. We have a $0 lease, and we are now in our third, fifth-year lease program. We actually started in... Uh, 2008, uh, actually 2007, we gathered together and became a state nonprofit in March of 08 and uh, IRS 501c3 in 09. Okay. A so lot of our energy in the last several years, with a lot of support from uh, Motor Cities, has been building stabilization that needed a lot of update. Nancy Thompson started us on our first grant through Motor Cities, and Brian's seen us for several others that we're working through. And now we've got an opportunity and a great member of our team, Larry Filardo, who's a great artist. He did an art series for the people of Haven Hill a couple of years ago. And we're, we're trying to move towards art programs for youth. Uh, take a cutout and a frame and go out and either take yeah. pictures, photography, draw art, paint art. And we're trying to move to that direction. So I'm not quite sure. Our, our, our budget is definitely on a small side. We're pinching every dollar that we get. So I'm curious as to the benefit that I see to me to link in to watch the panel review grants that have been submitted, even to give me an idea whether that's the way I would write, that's the way we could submit. And, and Nancy may have some input to us because of what she's done and what we've done. But we've come crawling slowly a long period of time to where we're at. Yeah. We have buildings that have been rebuilt, and now we're trying to move to program, I'm going to say, in the next two or three years. Yeah. Well, so the, the panel reviews are open to everybody, so they'll be posted on our website. And they'll be, I think we have, uh, I have 18 of them scheduled for operations. Uh, there's, there's like 25 grants that you'll be able to log in and watch uh, throughout the summer. They'll be posted on our website here in the next two weeks. You'll be able to check them out and you can just log in and do uh, what you want to. Typically eight to five during the week of uh, hour. Uh, are they done in the evening or? We're doing them on, because of our adjusted schedules, uh, we're doing them on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays 
and they're from nine to noon, and then there's a break, and then one to uh, four. So we're doing two panels a day. Usually we used to do one a day because everyone would have to come into Lansing and they were done in person, but now we're virtual so we can save a little bit of gas. And so Dick, what I was just thinking from all of this, especially if Larry's involved, is uh, um, if Larry sort of develops some programming in concept, it might be great to run it by Jeff or somebody else at MCACA and say, this is what we'd like to do, but we'd like to be able to supply the materials for our programming, you know, art materials or whatever, to be able to allow them to capture the essence of Haven Hill, something like that, and, and go through sort of the concept and what you hope to get out of it. And then I think Jeff or somebody else at MCACA could sort of guide you towards, well, what makes sense? Right. Bottom yeah. line, how much money do you need? Um, can it be used? Can you use in kind match like Larry's services or something like that as part of he's an artist and urban mm -hmm. planner and every, everything else, yeah. but um, you know, to be able to sort of figure out, you know, is it a mini grant that would be the best focus to start initially and try this programming out? But I think it's running the concept and the objectives by um, somebody yeah. at MCACA initially. Well, I, I, I'm sure that we would be in the mini program because our buildings are not completely done. We've come a long way, but we don't have any building yet with water, septic, and electricity. Who, who We're getting the DNR, the state of Michigan. A lot of times we've got problems where we go in for a grant, say, do you own the building? And it's no. Yep. And it stops the whole process because the landlord owner has to submit for bricks and mortar type stuff. Yeah, and the DNR is not eligible because yeah, we can't use state and fed funds to match state and fed funds, so they're they're out. But but you as a nonprofit inside, it depends on what your eligibility is. But if you're just using that space and you're if you're an arts and cultural nonprofit, uh, then you can apply for capital to purchase things that's portable. You know, you could buy right. computers or chairs. Well, I mean, one of the things that we we have done is um, we in our lease added verbiage for a visiting artist program. A yeah. lot of state parks have a resident artist where you give them a house, they stay yeah. three weeks, take pictures, paint oil, do whatever, leave something behind. And that's been shared with us from other fringe groups out of the Porcupine Mountains. Oh yeah. There, or, or, you know, uh, sleeping sand dunes type groups. Yeah. So when Larry did his uh, eight or nine portrait series of the people of Haven Hill a couple of years ago on an anniversary year, we changed our lease at, to allow us to do that. And long term, we may be able to have a facility at the gatehouse that would actually have rooming and accommodations, the studio where you live. But our garage attachment currently, we call it the studio because we display a lot of our artwork. We have many meetings and uh, small series and activity. We, we're crawling yeah. slowly, but I think there's an opportunity. I think I would most benefit from understanding, uh, just watch your grants and understand and talk to you because yeah, you we also, do have some programs. And for reference right now, you know, everyone, you can all visit the website, visit MCACS website and our main homepage on MCACS website and scroll down to the bottom and on the lower left-hand side, there's a couple links. You can check and find out, you can see who the grantees are by county. You can see the grantees are by, by program for last year for FY20. So that'll give you a list of a couple hundred organizations throughout the state that have received funding uh, from us. But I do think, Dick, you're right with the programming. I think that, you know, try it first with MCA, CA, just uh, focusing on some kind of programming. Yeah, yeah. So the big thing is first we just have to figure out eligibility. So send me an email, uh, Richard, send me an email, and then um, we'll go from there, the name of the organization, and I'll find out what your, what your, uh, what your tax status is, and then from there I can tell you what you can apply for, what you're eligible well, for. Well, we're in GuideStar. I'm sure that you can find us. Uh, we're yep. 501c3, and we've got a pretty active website and a good team of people. Okay. Uh, yeah. Some of us have been around, and we've just still got a lot of project work to do. Yeah. And GuideStar yeah. will tell you what your tax ID status is. It's in the middle down in the, like, on your screen. It's like right about here somewhere, <laughs> right in the middle when you're on your GuideStar link. And it, it'll just it'll just say your tax status, uh, or your code, your NTE code, and then uh, and if it starts with an A, or around there, then then your arts and culture organization, and if not, then your nonprofit. Okay, uh, Russ Doray has had his virtual hand raised, so uh, Russ, okay. let's unmute. I think you're muted. Yep. Okay. There we go. Oh, man, there. There yep. you go. Yep. Uh, thanks. 
Uh, on the mini grants, uh, do you have to be existing for three years like you do the other grants? Uh, no, nope. nope. You just have to be. You don't even have to have a 501 C3 mm -hmm. status yet. You just have to be registered in the state of Michigan as a nonprofit. We have a group that uh, is going to make a film on the history of Northville. Okay. Uh, similar to the one that was made on the history of Plymouth. And, uh, you know, we're, we, we've just, uh, the city uh, may do it, but we may set up a separate nonprofit. And uh, it would be a brand new one. Yep. Yeah, as long as you have, uh, sometimes people like to submit, when you, you, you talk to Jackie in our office about that, but yeah, if, if, you're really, if you're really, really new, then you just talk to Adam and Jackie about uh, being compliant, and then you can just send us your application sometimes for the IRS determined letter determination. Uh, but really, again, for many grants, you just have to be a nonprofit in the state. You don't have to be at that big 501 status yet. That takes a while for some. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions before we wrap it up? This is all great information and feedback. This opportunity to pin Jeff down on some things. Like I said, if not, then uh, just send me an email. Yeah. Um, the thing is that I can't stress enough that we're all we're all open and available to help you guys out, and we'll you know figure out what we can to help you out. And we. All our program managers have enough experience or we've, we've seen things in the past that we can say, well, you might want to try this or, you know, this group to this, maybe you consider that. So we'll try to help out any way that we can. Yeah, I mean, it's a great testimonial from, from Jill. And I'm, I think there's others on the call who may have received grants in the past. It's always good to get that perspective too, well, you know, yeah. from real people. The grant purveyor is the one that say, oh, no, it's, it's great. It's easy. It's, you know, flipping a pancake. It's no big problem. But did the actual recipients coming on and saying, you know, how, how the process went and, and what the value they've seen from it. So really appreciate that input from you. Uh, Richard, uh, Vic, were you going to say something else? Just trying to get to the email address or the website for MCCA. Oh, okay. MCACA. Yeah. Uh, I just Google it. It's, it's there. It's on, it's in the chat here too. Yes. Yeah. I put it in the chat there. So it, it links to the about us, which has all of their contact info. Okay. And there's another one in there about the grants and sales. Yeah. So, yeah. One thing I just want to say is, uh, just like Jeff said, everybody is so helpful. And if you need suggestions or direction, or I've needed clarification on things like, um, you know, is this or this the way? And they're so helpful. And the other thing is, for people like us that have longer term projects with Makaka, you can't apply for the same thing twice. But like for our project, you know, let's say for the Veterans Dormitory, the Ford Factory, you can apply for different pieces of the project. So for like the capital um, improvement, if there's, you know, museums or places that need, but you want to do lighting one year or flooring one year or roofing one year that you can apply. Um, and hopefully that hasn't changed and I'm not speaking out of term, Jeff, but that's been a benefit for us. Yeah. Um, that we've been able to apply. And the other thing is they're really big on accessibility. Um, so that places are inclusive and it's accessibility and where, you know, some people don't think that it says right in the capital improvement grant application that, you know, restrooms and lighting and parking, I mean, things that aren't very easy fun, to raise right. <laughs> that they're not fun and flattering projects, but right. those are kind of projects that Makaka does support. So that's a big deal. Yeah. The bricks and mortar aspect is it's usually for some kind of programming, no pay for staffing or any of these other things, but uh, yeah, it is exceptional. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. I said, we're, Michigan's unique with that program. It's a very, uh, there's a couple of states, New England has like a barn, a capital barn project grant they used to have to restore historic barns and things, but uh, yeah, Michigan's uh, the only one, if not only one, a few that offer funds to purchase equipment. I mean, try to find, raise money to buy a new computer. That's a tough one for some because most funders say it's going to be obsolete in five years. Why am I going to give you money for that? Yeah. It's like asking the money to buy a sandwich. You know, it's going to be gone. So I don't want to fund that. <laughs> People need it to eat. <laughs> sure, sure. Right. Okay, well, I think we're, uh, you know, we, we wound down and we covered all the questions. Uh, the slides will be available. Uh, we're going to send it out as a package. Uh, with our survey for the um, for the closeout of the lunch and learn itself, so you know, let's think about it that way. Is that we are looking to I'm sure you all are seeing this, uh, looking to uh, send them out that way. So look for that as well as the document. I think I shared it earlier or tried to share it earlier, but that's probably a funny way to get to the document he was sharing. So that'll be attached uh, as well. 
and you should be seeing plug about supporting us. You all see my screen? Yep. Uh, so again, if, if you are like this sort of programming, please feel free to support, become a member of Motor Cities if you're not already, or uh, donate directly via our PayPal link uh, so you can continue to support this sort of thing. And uh, Nancy, I put the plug here at the very end, so. That's excellent. I hope, I hope we see all of you next week and the week after. Yeah. It'll be really worth your while. Great. Well, that being said, thanks. Thanks everyone for joining us. I hope you lunched while you learned because I didn't see anybody eating any sandwiches, but maybe next time. Too. Great. I'll send a burrito your way, man. <laughs> Have a I nice drinking wine. Yeah, there you go. Great. Thanks again, guys. I appreciate it. It was great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Right. Take care, everyone. Yes, thanks again, Jeff. It's All wonderful. Right. Bye. Good job, Jeff. Hey. You're leaving one by one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing everybody going down. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy, for your comments. We still may need to talk, but we're... Oh. we're Say hi to Larry. Say hi to Larry. I'm glad he's still around. Yeah.